Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of, uh, of Building the Scottish State. We apologize for this, a couple technical difficulties which delayed the beginning of it. Uh, but anyway, here we are on the 16th of June, 2022. And uh, on this edition, I have the great pleasure to have with me Mr. Billy Kay author and uh, influential individual uh, who, has, uh, had the, who has been gracious enough to join us tonight. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for being with us this evening, Billy. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you, Mark. And Good. Excellent. Hopefully Excellent. the technical gremlins are behind us. Yeah, I, I hope so too. At, at least, at least for the audio. Uh, first of all, I, I just I be, only became aware of your existence when you did that lovely discourse between the uh, you know in front of the Scottish um, uh, Parliament uh, about you know kind of good, good feeling and goodwill. And when I emailed you after that, you said that you'd gotten a pretty heavy shock of of a kind of a, a backlash against the fact that you were speaking Scots in that. And I would just wanted you to, you know, tell us about that. I mean, I, I, I don't understand, it. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, to, from my own perspective, but if you could just talk a little bit about that, the fact that there was such a visceral reaction to you speaking the mother tongue of Scotland in the Scottish parliament. Yeah, well, some of it goes back a few, a few hundred years to the union yeah. of 1707, eh, but, the, the current reaction is quite a local and recent thing. And I think, I'm not sure how much of it is an actual reaction by humans and how much of it is a reaction by robots, bots, and yeah. trolls, a little troll factory somewhere in a, a suburb of Glasgow. But it's it's a bizarre, bizarre phenomenon because... The same hateful emails and reactions have appeared, and literally the same texts and the same reactions have appeared just about every time someone has used Scots uh, in recent in this, in the recent year, for example. So it's happened to Len Penny and Iona Fife and, and uh, one or two others who use Scots. And it's as if that triggers some kind of a uh, reaction uh, among the bots or some algorithm is triggered which provokes these hateful reactions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, fast, it's interesting, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's tragic at the same time that, that the human beings behind it are so alienated from their culture and so totally ignorant of their culture, that they can come away with things like, this is a made-up language invented by the SNP 10 years ago, when, you know, Scots first arrived in Scotland in the 7th century okay. via Anglians and has a literature going back a thousand years. Okay. Uh, so it's a bizarre, bizarre phenomenon. But... Yeah. I, I mean, my reaction to it was to have, I call, I call what I do is a block party where I now and again just have to go on to reactions to my videos or my tweets in Scots even and just block, block, block. Yeah. Uh, but as I say, I'm hoping somebody, I'm trying to get Ali Heather interested in investigating this in detail and writing an article about it to find out how it happens and who's behind it because mm -hmm. it's a strange, strange phenomenon. Really most is. of the people who yeah, most of the people who do this have a identities with a, a union flag and mm -hmm. many of them are supposedly supporters of Glasgow Rangers. A, but if I was the club Glasgow Rangers, and I saw all this hatred and bile uh, being produced by people who are so-called supporters. I think as a sure. club, I would be looking into it because it's it shames the club as well. Though an interesting yeah. historical detail is that the, the, the motto of Rangers used to be I ready, always ready, but they took mm -hmm. out the Scots word I about I would guess maybe about 30 or 30, 30 years ago, and now their motto is just ready. So they actually uh -huh. got rid <laughs> of the, the Scots element 
than their name a few days ago. Yeah, yeah. And also, given the kind of the Catholic Protestant thing between Northern Ireland and Scotland, you also have Ulster, Ulster Scots in Northern Ireland. That is a, you know, that I, I don't know to what degree it's spoken anymore. But um, yeah, I, I, I just yeah. want to speak a little bit of my own, you know, kind of, you know, obviously I'm American, my, you know, but uh, my father was Scottish and he, and I saw that you wrote a book kind of, kind of on the Scottish diaspora. And, you know, his father mm -hmm. was a very intelligent, uh, you know, a good, uh, you know, civil servant. And so he was a, and I have an actual passport from, I think, 1931 uh, or so of him because he was a, he, he worked on the Clyde, but he was um, uh, an engineer in the merchant marine going back between India and, and the U.S., and then after the war, he was a civil servant. He moved around to Wales and others. And then my dad went to Oxford, became an, an Anglican minister, and then went on to the United mm -hmm. States and left the Anglican church and became a Unitarian minister. But I think it's so much of the story of so many Scots that you, they can't make it. I, I, don't, I don't like to, you know, make it, you know, and, you know, it, it's just hard to be successful in Scotland, you know, to where you can, you know, just to make enough to raise a family and, and do well, for, you know, do well for yourself. So many Scots had to emigrate. And then so my knowledge, I remember my dad, you know, using Scots words, uh, or, you know, uh, th this type of thing. But I didn't even realize it was a, it was a separate language. I thought it was just a, 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 a you know, a, a really cool way of speaking English. But you don't really mm -hmm. realize. Mm -hmm. Well, that's you, and I knew about Gaelic. Yeah. Well, that's so one of the Gaelic the misunderstanding. Yeah, but I knew Gaelic was a separate language, but I didn't even realize until very recently, you know, working with Alf Baird and others, that yeah, Scots is was a real language, and it's been suppressed, and it's been you know, it's not taught in schools, and it's denigrated, and uh, so if you can speak to that a little bit, even me who grew up, you know, having a Scottish identity through my dad, I didn't even I didn't even hear of the Scots language until relatively recently, or ha have any real knowledge of it, you know, that it's separate, distinct. Yeah, yeah there's, you know, but there's it's, English, but it's but, it's a separate language like Italian and French or Spanish and yeah. Catalan and French, you know. So anyway, if you could speak to that. Yeah, well, these are the, the comparisons. Uh, people who are not linguists, people who are linguistically ignorant, see it can't be a separate language because I can understand some of it, and it's the, it shares a lot of words with English. But yeah. uh, my wife is Portuguese, and I speak Portuguese and have absorbed Portuguese, and lo and behold, I suddenly find that I I can understand Spanish yeah. because yeah. a lot of Portuguese and Spanish vocabulary is shared, as is Scots and English. The great uh, poet and folklorist Hamish Henderson defined it well when he said that Scots contains English but goes beyond it. There's another dimension with Scots. And one of the dimensions is the ability to express the landscape, the character, the weather mm -hmm. of the place that we've uh, lived in for a for over a thousand years. And and the other thing that identified Scots is the fantastic literature that's been produced in it. So although yeah. you say you are totally unaware of Scots, you and millions of people around the world sing Old Lang Syne. Yep. Uh, yep. Sure. Every hug my knee, and that's a song in perfect Scots. We twa he paddled in the burn and pooed the gowans fine, but we've trebled money a weary fit. It's an old Lang Syne. This is the language I grew up with in Ayrshire, in, in Kyle, in Burns country. And mm -hmm. uh, I was brought up to have pride in that language. Strong Burns influence. Uh, and that's what we spoke 90% of the time to 90% of the people. So for me and my generation, the last of the pre-television generations, uh, in a place like Galston in Ayrshire, where I come from, Scots was a living identity and part of our identity. It's only with the erosion of Scots in some places where people are unaware of what they're speaking or part of the inferiorization process of being a quasi-colony yeah. with people looking over their shoulder to England for three centuries is that the local culture, the indigenous culture, is treated with contempt and uh, people are taught 
that what language that they use that would have been spoken by James the Fourth and William Dunbar and Douglas and some of the greatest poets in Europe in the 16th century is now classified as slang, as gutter yeah. language. And yeah. if, if that's not a symbol of a culturally colonized, partly colonized country, then I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, what, how did you receive your, your education? I mean, I, 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 for example, when you, you know, when you go to school or elementary school, and maybe it was different for you, for your children, I'm not sure, but the whole idea that you were spoken, you know, the, the, I mean, I, li I live in Brittany in France. And I mean, I talk to people where, you know, they, they, you know, many years ago, apparently Breton was the most prior to the second world war, uh, Breton was the most spoken Gallic language anywhere, uh, even more than Welsh. Mm -hmm. And then the French really came down on it after that. And you would be punished for speaking your native tongue at school or, you know, and, and yeah. uh, Danik, uh, what was, what was your educational experience like? And what did you see in, I don't know, your children or others that, that followed in terms of the way that well, the, marginalized? Well, in, in Scots, the mother tongue, I, 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 there's a line that I've, that I've used a lot to describe my situation, which was that one of the ironies of an Ayrshire childhood in the 1950s was that you got a prize one day a year for reciting Burns's poetry, and then you got the belt, you get punished, you get chastised, you get physically assaulted Jeez. any other day for using his language. And that was realistic. The logelli, the toes, the strap was used in Scottish schools until, a, I think, throughout my, throughout my school career. I can't remember when they were, they were made illegal. But uh -huh. talking the local so, dialect... So, so basically, was, if you were sitting in class... Just to give an example, if you were sitting in class and you had somebody next to you and you were speaking in Scots and the, and the teacher heard you, they could come and slap you with a belt because of that. It maybe not have been as quite as direct as okay. that in my day. That definitely happened, and I know people that happened to. It would be more if you were speaking to the teacher. No, they understood that everyone spoke Scots in the playground. Yeah. Uh, that we all spoke spoke Scots, but they saw their remit. And again, the tragedy of this nowadays: anyone who's linguistically sophisticated knows that if you're bilingual, it's a lot easier to become trilingual or quadrilingual or multilingual. Yeah. But in those days, the wisdom in the unitary British state was that you suppressed any local culture there was to create a national culture. Mm -hmm. And France was the other country that happened then. When the French Revolution happened, French was a minority language. More people spoke Flemish, German, Occitan, Basque, Breton, Bret Breton, uh, Gallo, Catalan, and Gallo, Occitan. Where I live, Gallo is a, is is was the main language. Yeah. So, yeah. so the thrust of the French state was to normalize and to standardize French and yes. to try and kill off these so-called regional dialects. Yes. And in a similar way, and in different times, a Gaelic and Scots and Welsh and Cornish have had similar difficulties, depending on the political situation at the time. Mm -hmm. Gaelic yeah. very much in the 18th century when it was the language of, of, of rebels who had to be put down and their culture had to be uh, extirpated. Yeah. So it depends at different times. But in my day, it would be if you spoke to the teacher in Scots, it was regarded as sticking your tongue out to the teacher. You could be punished for that rather than speaking to your peers in Scots. Okay. Okay. Right. No, it, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 absolutely fascinating. I, I again, I just don't, you know, I, I come from the United States and it's almost looked down upon to be bilingual. You know, and uh, you know that the, the, oh, you're yes. you're some smarty pants if you speak more than one language. You know, and uh, you know, so I I, I know, sort of understand. Crazy. I know, I know. Yeah. 
I know. Uh, where, uh, yeah. So, uh, and so, uh, tell me. Uh, so, tell me a little bit about your the the, the books that you've written. I mean, you um, you you've written one about the, the Scots diaspora. You had the the Mither Tongue. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, what what are, what are some of the main things that you brought up in these books that you know, kind of, and also kind of going well, the, forward, and, the, and just very quick, just going forward towards independence. How can you know, what is the relevance of, you know, the historic Scots language and culture and what, how that can be restored to some extent upon independence in your view? Yeah. Well, my books are pro-Scotland. That, that's the main thing. A, the one on the diaspora shows the amazing contribution that Scots have made around the world. And, and not Carnegie just help. the English-speaking yeah. comment. Well, that's the easy one. Those are the easy ones. Everyone knows about John Muir and Andrew Carnegie and people like that in the States or Mackenzie in Canada yeah. or MacDonald in Canada. They're the ones that are, are understood. What my book goes into is goes way further back and mm -hmm. showing that in Poland and the the 17th century, there was an organization called the Scottish Brotherhood of wealthy merchants across Poland and Lithuania, cities like he, uh, like uh, uh, Łódź and uh, Lviv, for example, had branches of the Scottish Brotherhood. Very wealthy, very influential. The richest man in Poland in that period, a man called uh, Porcius, who controlled the wine trade across Europe. I, I get into the, all the lines with France. I go into the influence in Scandinavia, where three of the greatest people in Norwegian history, uh, Edvard Grieg, W.F.K. Christie, and uh, Peter Das, the poet, are all part of that Scottish diaspora. So what I, I try to show in the Scottish world is the amazing influence the Scots have had, and to extrapolate from that, the implication is that we, those people have a big influence where they went. And mm -hmm. it's slightly tragic that they, had, they have to go different places to have this big influence because yeah. those people working in a Scottish state could be having a similar influence. But the good thing is there's now goodwill for Scots because of the number of good Scots in different parts of the world who've made a positive impact, there's a lot of goodwill for Scots eh, in most countries in the world. And I've yeah. spent, I spent a lot of time traveling, including one year where I, I literally traveled around the world, and yeah. very few negative experiences, almost totally yeah. positive experiences. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, in, I think when they, the, you speak it, English, they say, oh, you British, are you English? No, I'm Scots. Oh, you're Scots. It, it, it's, you know, I've seen that yeah. reaction so many times, uh, you know, just that it's just, it's a completely different vision of, you know, a, a, you know, a Scots have yeah. a really powerful brand, you know, and. Uh, yes, uh, and, and, yeah. yeah. And, and even, I mean, an example, even within, for example, British colonies like, a. Uh, Nyasaland that became Malawi. The mm -hmm. Scots missionaries taught Africans the same curriculum as they taught Scots. There was no discrimination. And this was in the 19th century when scientific racism was endemic yeah, in yeah, other whole, European colonies Saxon, in Africa. Supremacy bullshit. You're yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. So we taught the result of that was that when a country like Malawi became independent. It was the the Christian in the local church turned over to the African Nas National Congress. It was the same people, and they became the the leaders in places like Tanzania, South Africa, who'd been educated in Scottish mission schools, and that even differentiated the Scots definitely from the English, and definitely from the Dutch who were other mm -hmm. colonists in that area. So other North yeah. European nations did not have that ideal of mass education for the masses that goes back to John Knox in the book of, first book of discipline in the 1550s and 1560s, when the desire 
to educate every man and woman, first men and then women, to be able to read the Word of God and then to write was such an advantage for working-class Scots that uh, that's what gave them this advantage in a lot of countries in Europe, especially Catholic countries in Europe, where they had this tremendous advantage of being literate. And that's why they had such a huge effect on the countries that they went to, going back as early as the 16th century. Okay. And, and, and I, I know that there's a lot of people that would, you know, quibble with the idea that Scotland's a colony. Oh, well, we, there was this, you know, this, this agreed union in 1707. Uh, Scotland was helped. It was able to, you know, go on the imperial stage with much more power. Uh, you know, that many fortunes, you know, in Glasgow and, you know, Merchant City and all that were made and it benefited. There was the shipbuilding industry, all of these great things. And so, uh, you know, and what to what do you extent do you see Scotland as 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 a colony? And you know, and, and you know, I I have my own vision. And, you know, it's similar to yours. And I'm you know, talking, yeah. You know, but how, how how do you see? Yeah. It? No, I'm I I'm referring to, I'm referring to call the I use the word Scotland colony. I'm not talking about a. A virtual, an actual call. I'm talking about a culturally colonized society. Right, right, right. Yeah. Where people have the idea that the native culture is the same level of the of of Odin, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's what I mean by a call. No, Scotland did after a few decades did benefit from the English markets being open to Scottish entrepreneur and to Scottish tradespeople. The main benefit was we joined the slave trade. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those that was jaded in and then from the middle of the 18th century on was through the slave trade, the tobacco trade in Glasgow. Sure. So sure. Yeah. people who defend the union and talk about the benefits that Scotland got from the union usually try and sidestep the fact that of the ugliness that was involved in the health that was created. But the ugliness was definitely there. And uh, in the British colonies, the horrors of the, the, the massives of the Aboriginals in Australia, yes. in every country, the, 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 the British established colonies, rarely was a, a benign situation for the native people of these countries. And there's no doubt the Scots took part in that. But hey, even places like Africa, they had this they had a saving grace in that they valued education and wanted a uh, African people to have the same education and the same advancement that they had. And that was unusual among European colonies in the in the nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And how do you see, um, what is your reaction to this week's uh, announcement by Nicola Sturgeon of the of the independence referendum? Well, the, the Ang that uh, Angus um, Robertson said would be uh, in October 2023. Uh, how, how do you see that? I mean, uh, and, and, uh, I mean, there's been, in my view, in the 2014, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Well, in my, uh, I'm delighted that uh, was that announcement, and I look forward to uh, seeing how she handles the various things that are going to be away in the next few months. But I, I think she's a remarkably astute politician because I have contacts across Europe. I'm aware of the high regard that she's held across Europe. And uh, I think that's another thing that will stand us in good stead when we do become independent. And I think there's a lot of goodwill to Scotland across Europe for Scotland to rejoin the EU very, very easily uh, because of the goodwill that exists across Europe for Scotland. And a lot of that is down to the statesmanship, stateswomanship that Nicola Sturgeon uh, evinces. I'm aware that, I mean, I've been as frustrated a... Uh, as a lot of people, by the restrictions placed by COVID, etc. 
But I don't think she could have gone any... Personally, I don't think she could have gone any earlier on this. I think that Mm -hmm. now is... Now's the day and now's the hour. It's time to go for it. And the fact that she's looking at what else she can do if a bumbling blonde buffoon in London says no, which she undoubtedly will, then the fact that she's contemplating that suggests to me that she, she's she got a strategy that'll, that that's she's all have a referendum. So very positive at the moment, I would say. Okay. All right. And what do you think, of, I mean, in our work the in the Scottish uh, Sovereignty Research Group, uh, Sarah Salyers, who works with us, has, ta- has brought up uh, the, you know, the, the 1689 claim of right, the, the you know, the, 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 uh, the conditions under which the Treaty of Union of 1707 was, or, you know, or uh, 1706 acts were imposed. Uh, and the and there's th- this whole idea that you know that you know it's part of a uh, you know of of a, a voluntary union, uh, and that if you're in a in, if you're on, in a, in a in a treaty that is yeah. in and there have been so many breaches of it, then any state is able to just simply withdraw from it. Um, uh, but uh, so how do you see that? I mean, you know, but that that you know a lot that's very old, but at the same time. The English government, they still refer to the Magna Carta and the, and the English Bill of Rights of 1689. So how do you see using these historic Scottish constitutional documents in the modern era of becoming, you know, of basically withdrawing yeah. from the Treaty of Union? Yeah, well, the and, and our... The sovereignty of the Scottish people goes back to at least as far back as 3020 and the magnificent declaration of our growth, where a remarkable document where it says that if King Robert the Bruce doesn't support the cause of an independent Scotland, we'll rid of them and replace them, which is quite an addition. Stay for that period. So paramount and it be a vote and any state should be able to withdraw but the the huge uh, weight of the the propaganda against the Scottish position from yeah. the media that people unfortunately consume on a daily basis is such that a lot of people can't even contemplate that but yeah. as I say in the next few months that'll be I think a born out when we do achieve the 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 desire for the final referendum, which I I do think will will happen next year. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. A uh, couple of questions. Um, some of them are on a similar theme. Could the adverse reaction to Scott's language be part of the cultural cringe and colonization mentality? I think that you've answered to that somewhat. But if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, well, yes, yes. I think that's a good question, and it's the un, the understatement of the century. Or well, the cringe, isn't the cringe because it's self hatred. It really is. It's uh, it's self hatred when people have are so ignorant of who they are and the glories of their civilization that they can come away with the things that they, they used to, uh, yeah. to attack people who promote Scottish culture is, uh, yes, it's part of the cringe, but it's, it's deeper than that, and it's it's uglier than that, unfortunately, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, how do we persuade those against the use of Scots, the Scots language that there's nothing to be afraid of? And do you, and do you see like a kind of the possibility of a reversal? I mean, I, I look at, for example, I spent a lot of time in Catalonia and I mean, you know, they speak Catalan, they speak Spanish. There's nothing contradictory, but they're both, they're by, bi- most of them are bilingual and it's a good thing as we are pointing out. And yeah. so, I mean, do you see that there could be a kind of a renaissance of the Scots language upon independence where it's taught and you know, embraced and celebrated and, uh, yeah. and that, you know, and not that it replaces English necessarily, but that it's, um, it's an additional language that yes, I, gives 
people another way of thinking, you know, which I think a lot of people don't realize about different Yes, languages. I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do. A, and the revival of Catalan and Galician and Basque a, came with democracy, with the death of Franco and the creation of a democratic, a democratic Spain, uh, which I think might eventually lead to Catalan independence. But the difference man and Scots was the middle class speaking Catalan, whereas the middle class and upper classes gradually lost their Scots over a long, long period of time. And it tends to be the working that's with the political will to revive Scots it would be comparatively easy to revive. Mm -hmm. and just in, in other words, when people are speaking colloquially and not formally in Scotland, the, a lot of the dialects and the structure of the various dialects of Scots are still there, yeah. uh, uh, under yeah. the surface yeah. and in the yeah. privacy of their own home. Uh, they're there. So all you need to do often is to add vocabulary and Vocabulary is the easiest thing to learn. I mean, I must have, as a teenage teenager, I must have learned, I don't know, 500 new French and German uh, words in my first year at, at secondary school. Imagine if they were Scots words. Uh, and people say, oh, you can't revive things. It's artificial. Well, you know, words like uh, Latte and Cappuccino were in this, I was aware now everyday words and people know what they are. So it's easy to add new vocabulary. And uh, what I see is Scotland right now is what it is where the three indigenous language languages are all revered equally and given status. And uh, mm. I, I am positive about the future, but it would take independence for that to happen because mm. There is such a backlash and such an ignorance surrounding Scots that the, the real push <clears throat> excuse me, won't happen until after independence. Having mm -hmm. said that, there's always good initiatives happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ur Rights campaign by young people to get to get a uh, status for Scots, equal status for Scots, is ongoing. There are good people in schools in Scotland teaching Scots. And there are good people in the universities teaching Scots. So it's not just an underground language. But it does have, I mean, there is Scots dictionary. Go to dsl.ac.uk and every Scots word is there. And that's professionally run, the Dictionary Association. So mm. there are people, there's great young writers writing in Scots today. So there's a lot to be positive about. Songs, I mean, the imagine... Scottish culture song and for that are all the same or fluor of Scotland, etc. etc. So the Scots is an integral part of Scots culture, even though some people <clears throat> have that which has been suppressed. But there's a lot yeah. to be positive about, but it'll only realise its potential after independence and it will rival a bigger revival after after independence okay and what do you see i mean what should be put in a, a scottish constitution uh, that that could promote that i mean maybe of, officially recognizing scots gaelic english as official languages and you know maybe to promote you know what do you think could be put into a governing structure you know, in terms of education, in terms of recognition that could help, you know, kind of revive, you know, the Scots language and, um, you know, in, in general and the Ga yes. in Gaelic and the other languages to where Scotland can be trilingual, catrilingual, no problem, you know, and not have it be looked down upon. Oh, you only can speak one language. And if yeah. you're more of than course. one, then you're, then you're some kind of goody goody yes. or something like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, Switzerland has a uh, German, French, yeah. Reto Romanish, and Italian as official yeah. languages. So Scotland can very much have its three indigenous languages, and it should be in the constitution when we when we create that one. 
of mm. equal respect for them and yeah. uh, equal resources for them too. At the moment, Gaelic is more resourced and more supported than Scots. Although there is support for Scots, it's not on the same level as Gaelic. And because there are one and a half million Scots speakers and 5,000 roughly uh, Gaelic speakers, then there's an anomaly going there, which I would hope mm. would address too after, after mm. independence. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're drawing to a conclusion, but I uh, just wanted to ask you if there's anything you wanted to, uh, to, to say to our viewers before we say goodnight. Hey, hod gone, hod for it. Day or best. There's a, there's a lot of positive things going on. And I think, personally, <clears throat> because my family's across you, my children, uh, based uh, in Zurich, Frankfurt, and Brussels, and through them and through my and through one with great organisations which deserve your support, like Yes for EU in, in Edinburgh, who are beginning to do work outside, Edinburgh, and Europe for Scotland, which is a marvellous organisation. You can sign their petition there. And it's run by a young woman, a young Italian man, and Anthony Arne from England, people who have lived in Scotland and who love Scotland and promote Scotland returning to its state and its independent state and nation within Europe. So because of the Brexit, anniversary is coming up. There'll be one or two things going on there. And the goodwill that exists for Scotland, even from people like the luggage handlers at Lisbon Airport, they're desperate for Scotland to rejoin the EU. Yeah. And yeah. even though some people have raised about like the EU, I'm calling people to send any reservations they have until after we're independent, because mm. it is such a vote winner. I have a group of friends who, some of them, I would say half of this group that I know, voted no in the last referendum for various reasons. I would think that about two thirds of those people who voted no would now vote yes to get back mm. into Europe. So I mm. think we should make that at the forefront of the independent campaign, because I think a lot of people who were in the past would now join us and make a Scotland independent core European dimension. Okay. Okay. On that note, thank you very much. Please stick around for a couple minutes uh, after after we finish the the credits. But uh, uh, just thank you so much, uh, Billy Kay, for being being with us this evening. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you, and hope you hope to have you uh, have you back in the near future. But uh, again, please stick around for a few minutes afterwards. <laughs>